Corinthians 15, I will start off by saying that the church that was located at Corinth was a very troubled church. As a matter of fact, they had so many problems that Paul had to write 2 Corinthians as well. That's true. They had lots of questions. They had been inundated with people coming in the church that were practicing heresies, questioning the gospel, and practicing sexual immorality. There was a temple in the city that was run by bald-headed prostitutes. They shaved their heads to let people know they were prostitutes and that was part of their worship service in that pagan temple. That is why you see a lot of verses in the book of Corinthians that you do not perhaps understand why he said what he said about some of them and he was addressing the problems that were there. And a lot of them had come over into the Christian church unconverted and were trying to push their theology on the people in the new church at Corinth. So you will see a lot of that as you read. And so Paul felt it necessary to start off with the first few verses explaining the gospel to the church at Corinth in this letter again. And I think it's always prudent and pertinent for us to do the same thing from time to time in our own church is to read what the gospel is and then he answers a question that has been popping up in the church at Corinth and we'll look at that in just a moment. He said, moreover brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand. That's important these days that we make that stand on the gospel. By, the, by which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. The Old Testament scriptures explained exactly how Christ would die and we saw it fulfilled in the New Testament. And then he said this, he died for our sins, number one, number four, verse four, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And he was seen of Cephas, then of the 12. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some have died. And after that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. He appeared to the apostle Paul and to be one of the original apostles, you had to have seen the resurrected Christ. Paul was the last of the original apostles. The position of apostle is a different thing, but to be one of the original or whatever, you had to have seen the resurrection, resurrected Christ and he did. And Paul said, I was one that was born out of due time. And then he says this to let people understand, for I am the least of the apostles, and I am not, and, and that I'm not even suitable to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Paul struggled with his past until the day he died. Not that it was a bad thing, but it kept him humble and reminded him of what he came from. And that's something that maybe we ought to do once in a while before we get tempted to be high and mighty and look down our nose at somebody else. And then here was the good part of it. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. The reason that you are saved this morning and on your way to heaven is because of nothing but the grace of God. 
There isn't a thing anybody in here can do to earn it or hang on to it or do whatever. It's all got to be done by the grace of God. And he gives you the ability to do what you do. And he said, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. And he said, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preached and so you believed. And now here's the, the question. And believe it or not, even in today's churches throughout America and of the world really, there is an argument, there is a question, and there is doubt. And he says this, now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? What some people say, and they believe even today, and they're not true Christians, a true Christian could never say that there is no resurrection of the dead. They can't do that. You cannot speak by the Holy Spirit of God and speak a blasphemy or a heresy. You cannot do that. If you stand there and say there is no resurrection of the dead, you simply are lost. You need to understand that part right there. All right. Now, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? So that makes the gospel a lie. The whole premise of eternal life that we look for in the scriptures that God promised us all hinged on the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. There was a group of of infidels and idiots out years ago that said Jesus never really died on the cross that he swooned please and that the cool air of the tomb revived him oh yeah all of the skin was beaten off of his torso front and back with a whip to where you could see his rib cage then he was beaten and beaten some more and beaten some more. He had two inch thorns jammed in the top of his head. He had nails in his hands and nails in his feet. And then they jammed a spear all the way into his heart and it said water and blood came out and he just swooned. You know, the quality of the ignorance is increasing. You gotta give it that. <laughs> You got to give it that. And they said that he came back to, he, he revived later in the tomb. Well, a man in that condition, weakened if he did, could not have rolled that big stone away that took six men to put in place. So it just gets dumber by the minute, and I do not need to continue on with that. But there are some people that do not believe that he resurrected from the dead and Paul said if there is no resurrection then is Christ not risen and if he did not rise from the dead this is all in vain this whole idea of salvation this whole idea of eternal life this whole idea of heaven it's all in vain people it's all in vain and if Christ be not risen then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. I was talking to a brother before church today about the calling for ministry. And I told him, I said, it will consume your life. You will not be able to think of much else but ministry. Be you man or woman, if God puts that calling in you, you will not rest until you do what he tells you to do. Amen. I remember going into the ministry 26 years ago full time. Now, I've been in the ministry about 36, but I went full time. I made a huge step. I, I, I gave away a good job. It had benefits. It had a future 
but that was not what God wanted me to do. I had a lot of really great jobs that I could never feel right doing any longer. I sacrificed an awful lot to be doing what I'm doing, and I'm not going to go into a whole lot of details, but I did. It cost me dearly to do what I'm doing. And to think for one minute that what I'm doing is in vain, that is probably about the most devastating thing I can think of because I have put my entire life and my family's life into this ministry, into the calling that God has given me that I know he gave me. There is no, de- let, me say, let me say something. If you want to know whether or not you're called, run from God and see what happens. <laughs> Try that and he'll yank you back hook, line, sinker, boat, motor, anchor, and everything. Kicking and screaming, buddy. And so I know it's real. I have studied this Bible every day since I was 12 years old, and I know it's real. I studied apologetics. I studied homiletics. I studied hysterics. (laughs) And I can tell you one thing. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's what I learned. But there are some people that said he didn't rise from the dead. And he said our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. You've got your faith in a dead man over somewhere in the Middle East if in fact Christ did not rise. And he said, yes, we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up if it so be that the dead rise not. I'm the biggest liar in the building if in fact Christ did not rise. I have spent the last 20 some years of my life telling people that he did over and over and over again staking my reputation, my name, and even the name of God on the fact that he rose from the dead. And if he did not rise from the dead, I have been lying to you and you have all been believing a lie. That's what Paul said. Then he said, if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, Your faith is in vain, and you are yet in your sins. There are many people I can walk up and down the aisles and talk to, and you can tell me the date and time that you got your sins forgiven. Most of you are saved, and it may have been a while back, but you can all testify that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your sins were forgiven on a certain date when you accepted Christ as your savior. But if Jesus did not rise from the dead, you were still nothing but a dirty old sinner on your way to hell. There is no, you have not been forgiven and you have fooled yourself. If Jesus did not rise, everything we are and everything we believe hinges on the fact that he rose from the dead. It wasn't enough for him to walk on this earth living a sinless, perfect life. And it was not enough for him to die on a cross because of the sins that we committed. But it was all contingent on the fact that he rose from the dead, period. That's the most important thing. And he said when he uh, when he talked to the disciples, he said, because I live You will live also. Now, this is another tough one. Then they which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. I don't know how many funerals I have done in my ministry. Scores and scores and scores of them. Some of the people I did not know very well and some of the people I did and loved very dearly. I have provided comfort for hundreds of people 
when I sat down with them and I said, your loved one is with the Lord because I know they were saved. I talked to them and you will see them again. But if Christ is not risen, you will not see them again. They won't see you, they're just dead. And what an awful thought to have. We are created to somewhere in our soul believe in an eternity. Whether you admit it or not, somewhere in your soul is a belief that there is an eternity and there is an afterlife. But if Christ did not rise, there, there, is, there is no afterlife. I would, I've said this many, many times, but I don't mind saying it again. The toughest day of my ministry was preaching my mother's funeral. She always wanted the last word whenever we got into a discussion. And, so, and she usually won the argument. She was a highly intelligent woman. And she said, son, I want you to preach my funeral. She knew she was dying. And I said, mama, why in the world would you want me to preach your funeral? Don't you know what that, how hard that's going to be? She said, yeah, but you're the only one that really knows me that well, and you're going to do it. And I said, all right. And it was really, really tough. That's your mother, you know. I mean, my goodness. Really, really tough. Hardest thing I ever did. But the one thing that kept me going is I know my mother is saved. There is no doubt in my mind that she's saved. She's the one that led me to the Lord in 1969. And she lived the word of God in front of her children and grandchildren. One of the greatest ladies in the world. But if there is no resurrection from the dead, that was the last time I ever saw her was in the, the coffin. As an aside to that, the night before the funeral, we went to view my mom. And believe it or not, she looked like 25 years younger laying there in that casket. I asked the funeral director, I said, How'd y'all do that? And he says, a guy named Tony in the back that can do that. I said, where is he? They took me back there. And I said, can you hook me up? <laughs> he said, yeah, but you got to die before I can do any of that. So do I look forward to eternity? Yeah, you better believe it. I can get my youth back too. But if there is no resurrection from the dead, all of our loved ones are gone and we'll never see them again. And that is the most awful prospect of all that we have looked at. Amarissa's back there shaking her head. No, 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 no. I think she gets it. And then Paul really lays it on us. And he said, if in this life only... We have hope in Christ. We are of all men most miserable. Think about what you have done to serve the Lord. How you have kept yourself or tried to keep yourself from the rudiments of this world as best you could. How many of you have even lost family and friends over the cause of Christ by making your stand. How many of you have sacrificed this and sacrificed that so that you may live for the Lord? And then only to find out there's nothing after this life. That's it. You're done. That's why Paul said we're of most men most miserable. Because in the Roman Empire, when all of this was going on, when, when they discovered that Christianity was not just a part of Judaism, the emperor outlawed it and they began killing Christians on the street when they found out they were Christians. They would walk up to them and the question a Roman soldier would ask is, are you one of them? That's all he would say. And you either had to deny Christ or confess him and if you said, I am, they killed you right then and there. 
I want you to think about the people over in communist China. The underground church is the largest church in the world. There are thousands of them and they have to hide to worship. And if they are ever caught, the, the Chinese communists take the pastor out and beat him to death in front of the congregation. Now, I will admit, you'd be hard pressed to get away with that in here. But nonetheless, that's the fear they live in. Every single day, the only visible churches are state-run churches that are told what they can say and what they can't say, kind of like what Governor Northam tries to do right now. Well, we're not a state-registered church. I can promise you that. But think about it. What they have to suffer in communist nations for the cause of Christ. And what if they were to suddenly discover that it was for nothing? Wouldn't that be really, really awful? All of the things, the charities and all of the colleges founded by Christians to train Christians would all have been for nothing. But Paul makes a statement here after he's got us really, mm, got us down here. He said, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Because he lives, we can live also. He proved it over and over and over in front of hundreds of people that he was alive. And just when they thought he might be a ghost, he asked them, do you have anything to eat? And they had some fish and a honeycomb and he sat down and ate it in front of them. And then there was that last disciple by the name of Thomas that wasn't there that night. And he said, I will not believe until I can put my fingers in the nail prints of his hands and thrust my hand into the hole in his side. The next night he appeared there in front of his people again and he said, Thomas, he said, come here. And he said, put your fingers in the prints of my hand and put your hand in my side and, and, and don't be unbelieving. And Thomas didn't know what else to say, but my Lord and my God. Then Jesus looked at him and said, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. And then for the rest of us, he said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Let me say this to you. Of all the years I have spent in ministry, I staked my life and the life of my family on the fact that Jesus did, in fact, rise from the dead. And that he's waiting for us, and one day he's going to come and get us and take us home to be with him. All the years I have served the Lord, I have watched him answer prayers. I have watched him heal the impossible. I have watched him sustain me and my family, and no matter what I have done, he has never, ever let me down. And you can rest assured, he is very much alive. He said, I've got the keys of death and of hell. And he said, I was dead once, but I am alive forevermore. I'm the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the alpha and omega people. He is alive and we need to start acting like he is. <laughs> watched drunks and drug addicts change their life and never look back because of the fact that he is alive. I have watched the worst of the worst make a complete turnaround in their life that no program, that no other forms of counseling or anything could ever do. I've watched a miraculous change because of the fact that he is alive. I've seen people healed from the most impossible diseases because of the fact 
that he is alive. This is not a fairy tale, beloved. This is real. It's as real as it gets. And we need to never, ever fear anything because of the fact that he is alive. Don't ever be ashamed of your faith. Don't be afraid to stand up against all odds and share that because the one that rose from the dead is going to come back and snatch you up off of this earth one of these days. And I don't want to stand before him where I've denied him or where I've doubted him or what. I want to make a stand for him while I am here. Amen. Folks, he is alive. He is very much alive. And if you, if you don't know whether or not he is, you've never experienced that, talk to him. He's still alive. He'll, he'll answer you. He'll answer your prayers. He'll reveal himself to you. Don't ever worry. He is alive. Shall we stand? I want you to understand this is what it's all about, the fact that he rose from the dead. He has power over death. He has power over life. And he wants you to trust him today. There may be somebody here that you've heard what was said and you've never actually trusted him as your savior. If that is true, I'm going to ask you to come and take one of these folks by the hand and let them pray with you. So you can walk out of here knowing for a fact that you're saved. Maybe you are saved, but the devil has been attacking you with doubt and fear and everything he can throw at you. And let me tell you, you're not alone. You're, about everybody in here has had that. And you need some strength and you come and pray. Maybe you need someone to pray with you over another matter. It doesn't make any difference what it is. This altar is always open for you no matter who.